Hi, and welcome to the series of In Conversation With. Today, I'm in Kiligar House, which is on the borders of Cavan and Leitrim. My guest today is Lady Kilbracken, otherwise known locally as Lady Sue. Thank you for talking, for talking to us today, Lady Sue. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. What an amazing house, Kiligar House. It's amazing, an amazing approach. The avenue, one mile long, the house, and, and its history. Yes, it is. It's quite a fascinating place. And I often say to people, it's a bit like going back in time 200 years, which is when the house was built. So I'm sure you've got that sense of that feeling too. As you come up the long avenue, you start to feel that the, you know, the day-to-day -day routine life is sort of fading into the background and then suddenly yeah. you approach this old courtyard. Yes, we did, I did feel as we were driving up that we were going into another world, which is not that I would not, we would not be used to generally, because you are with, on, on beautiful grounds with three lakes, I believe, in the... That's right, property. three lakes and a river. Okay, so tell me how a house of this size and this enormity and this scope got built here 200 years ago. Well, the house, the lands were originally bought by somebody called Richard Morgan in about 1734, and it was his daughter, Mary Morgan, who married a godly and it was eventually her grandson who came to, he decided he wanted to come and live here and he came here in 1813 and legend has it he built the house for the woman he loved who was someone called Kate Daly and they married in 1813 and uh, they lived here their entire lives and their eldest son was born the following year in 1814. They've got great connections with New Zealand no less than? That's right, um, their eldest son in fact was John Robert Godley who founded Christchurch in New Zealand in 1850 and the family are very well known out in New Zealand because of that. Um, but he founded Christchurch and then he returned back here. In fact, he didn't live in Ireland, he lived in Wales. Now, maybe you can explain to me, and I'm amazed because obviously it's not part of our Irish culture, where, where, um, how, they, how they came to be Lord and Lady. Um, that happened because uh, John Robert's son, Arthur, was only 15 when he inherited Kiligar, uh, when his father died. And uh, because his father had been such a famous statesman, the Prime Minister in England at the time was William Gladstone, and he took him under his wing. And so when he graduated from university, he became William Gladstone's private secretary from the age of about 23. And he then went on to become Under Secretary of State for India. And he was firstly created a knight, so he became Sir Arthur Godley. And then when he retired in 1909, he was given a peerage, and that is effectively the title of, of Lord. Um, and he decided that instead of calling himself Lord Godley, which he thought sounded a little bit too religious, that he would honour a place, which is conventionally what happens. So he chose the place um, name, which is a townland that was part of the estate at the time. It's just across the, the house lake, and it's called Kilbracken. So he became Arthur Godley, first Lord Kilbracken of Kiliga. And of course, when Lord Kilbracken gets married, his wife is Lady Kilbracken. That's right. And you live here in the area. You are not, uh, you are not a, an Irish native. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, how are you perceived as a lady in the area? How does that work? How does how do the locals? How does how does that work? Um, well, I think living at Kiligar, um, being here, and and obviously being married to John Lordy, as he was called locally, very affectionately by all of the locals, um, that put me in a bit of a fishbowl right from the beginning. And of course, I'm Australian, and I came here and first came here at Christmas 1980. And in those days, um, that was before Home and Away, that was before Neighbours and Crocodile Dundee, and nobody knew anything about Australia at all, except it was the place that their ancestors had probably gone to on a ship some time ago and never, never to be seen again. And that there were kangaroos, they were the only two things. So I was a bit of an oddity anyway, um, because I was so foreign, um, even though I spoke relatively the same language. Um, and also because I'd married Lord Kilbracken, who was, of course, a lot older than me. So that, again, you know, raised eyebrows and, and yeah. caused a few questions. Very interesting. He was, in fact, um, he was almost 60 while well, you were in your early 20s. That's right, when we married So, him. yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, how did that come about? You met him in London. I met him in London, and he was and remains one of the most fascinating men I've ever met. Uh, very sophisticated, very well-educated, extremely worldly. Um, incredibly charismatic, um, very entertaining raconteur, had lived the most amazing life. Um, he'd been a pilot in, in the war, he'd been a bomber pilot in the Second World War, he became a treasure hunter, he was um, a 
photographer, he was a journalist, he was a war correspondent. There wasn't anything he hadn't done, really. I mean, and, and also with Kiligar, he'd, he tried everything he could to keep it going. Yeah. So he was absolutely fascinating. And um, strangely, he also found me interesting. And uh, I remember one time, not long after I'd met him, he was talking to his brother on the phone. And I, I was in the room, obviously, I could hear what he was saying. And he said, I've met this wonderful girl, she's amazing, she's you know, intelligent, she's clever, she's witty, she's got everything. The only thing is, she should be about 40 years old. And I thought, well, that's interesting. He's feeling this too, that there was this age difference. And I just thought to myself, well, does it really matter? And uh, it didn't really. I mean, if you think, if you, if you meet the right person, does age really matter? Did it ever matter? Um, I think it did. It did eventually, but n not for the reasons that you might think. I mean, it's, um, it was a generational thing. So, uh, for instance, humour is very much a generational thing. Uh, things that I would have perhaps seen on television when I was a kid, I mean, he knew nothing about. Things that he knew a lot about, say, from the 60s and 70s, I knew absolutely nothing about. Did you grow together or apart in this time, in um, that time? I think over time, we unfortunately, we grew apart. And then lat latterly, in his latter years, we grew together again. Of course, you do have your son, Sean. That's right, yes, I had Sean. And uh, he was John's golden head boy. He was still allowed to have a son at the age of 60. And um, that was, he, Sean was the light of his life, without any doubt about it. He has two older children, uh, Christopher, who's in England, who's the current Lord Kilbracken. He inherited the title when his father died. And he has a lovely daughter, Lisa, who lives in Scotland. She's a retired school teacher. She's gorgeous. And in yeah. fact, she and her family, uh, all of her family, her husband, her son and his wife and their two children and her daughter and her partner are all coming over in about two weeks' time to stay for a week, which is really exciting. So that's great fun. To get back to what you're speaking about earlier about your husband John, and uh, I've seen some photographs of him. And if you don't, if you don't mind me saying so as well, he looked pretty interesting looking. He was a handsome man, and he looked interesting. And I can perhaps see the attraction there yes. at the time. And as did your son, and. Uh, they're all artists in their own sense. Your son is a writer as well. That's and you right. said that family members all going back were writers as well. They all wrote, or they, they did have, well, John's mother wrote um, as well. And, but John was the one who was the, that was his career, really. He was a journalist and an author. He wrote 14 books. Was that enough to, to, to keep him and this house going, or how did that work? Uh, well, he tried everything to keep the house going. Was um, that why he was a journalist, to keep the house going, or was he just a journalist and it, didn't, it, it did or it didn't keep the house going? Well, he became a journalist. In fact, it's an interesting story how he became a journalist. He, when he was at Oxford, what happened is he went to the war, and the war finished obviously in 1945, and then he went back to Oxford to study for two years. And during that time, he knew that he wanted to become a writer and a journalist, but he wasn't quite sure how he'd get in. And as it happened, he started dreaming the winners of horse races. And it happened a lot. And he would wake up in the morning and he'd say to his friends, well, I dreamt that, you know, little Fred won the third at Cheltenham today. And they'd all back little Fred for whatever it was, and it would win. And it kept happening. And it happened so often that he decided to get in touch with the Daily newspaper. I think it's what eventually became the Express, the Daily Express. And he told them the story, and he told them that, you know, that morning he dreamt that whatever three horses were going to win, win that afternoon at the races. And they said, well, if they win, um, we'll do a story. And he said, no, if they win, I'll do the story. I want to become a journalist with your paper. So they won, and he became a journalist. It was a good bargain. It was a good bargain. And he became a racing correspondent then for a few years. Okay, so obviously been a lord in the House of Commons, uh, he would have had to attend the House of Commons and spend some time of the year over there, and you were there as well. House of Lords, but yes, that's, that's right, it was the House of Lords, it, mm. um, a bit like in Ireland, where, they, where you have the upper house and the lower mm. house, it's the same in England, so it's the House of Commons, but he was attending the House of Lords. And, but he didn't become a lord until he already was an established journalist. He'd been an established journalist for about five or, five or six years when he inherited the title in 1950. And that meant that he could sit in the House of Lords, but he didn't take his seat for a couple of years. He was a bit, he felt a bit uncomfortable about it, I think. Um, but then when he did, he always spoke up for Ireland, always. Um, and he would speak up for things that were important to him, like the, um, the Wildlife and Countryside Bill anything to do with animals or farming, anything that he knew about. So my next question to you is, is when you're looking at what's going on uh, in the world, in, in, between our, in Ireland and England at the moment, and you see the politics and you see what's going on with Brexit 
and uh, the sort of way Ireland is at the moment. Where would your heart lie in all of this? I mean, you've had the inside, on, you, yeah. you know, on the both sides. Well, what would well, your take at the moment be? Interesting, always Ireland, always. Um, it was, I fell in love so with So your Ireland. first love is Ireland? Oh, definitely, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. And your son went to national school here, which is he did. great um, integration he, Yes, he did. Um, not, he went to Dremila, which is a little local school. He didn't go there full time, but what would happen is when he would come home from holiday, um, when mm. we, we were in England, um, he would come here and he would go to the local school, which was brilliant of the school teachers to allow him to do that. But so to get back to that on the political level, you would, your heart would be with Ireland? Oh, definitely, definitely. Even, I have to say it's quite funny, even if Ireland play Australia in any kind of sport, I always secretly want Ireland to win, but I'll have to hand in my passport <laughs> if I say that. Go away, yeah. yeah. Oh no, definitely, yeah. because this is where I live, so I would much rather everyone where I live is, is happy because Ireland has won, yeah. than, you know, sort of think, well, everyone in Australia is happy because the Aussies mm. have won something. So. But when you do see the politics, of, of the House of Lords or the, the English government working out at the moment. Have you an inside track maybe that the rest of us don't have because you had that connection with, with the, yes, the House of Lords? Yes, I would do and I can give you a very good example of that um, and it dates back to 1982 when the, um, the prisoners over in Belfast were on hunger strike and John was approached by um, the leading members of Sinn Féin at the time, Rory O'Brady, and we went uh, to a meeting with him in Balnamore because they wanted to broker peace with the British and they respected John enough to ask him to go and try and talk to them and broker peace and try and sort something out at the time. And uh, we met, I remember going into the pub in Balnamore, you could have heard a pin drop because there was Lord Kilbracken coming in with this woman with this baby in her arms, so it was all a bit strange. And um, he uh, spoke, spoke to Rory O'Brady as I did and um, we went back to England and he uh, got in touch with the Home Office and basically the British government didn't want to know to, about making peace at that time. So very frustrating when you can see something like that mm -hmm. and when you think about all the people who were killed and things that happened subsequently that could have been avoided. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, that kind of insight is, is depressing and frustrating really. Okay. So to get back to the Lady Kilbracken of today, uh, you're a very attractive lady, you are able to get out and about you. and uh, your heart, as I was just speaking to somebody earlier, I was saying that um, living in a house like this, uh, the house becomes, your every move, your every action is about the house, oh, yes. whereas most of us just live in a house and you get in and you walk around <laughs> and you go to work in the morning and you come home and you do your things, you don't think about your house. But your house is your life. How does, how does that work? How, oh, how have you got the energy to keep it going? Because it's huge, it's cold, it, it, it needs a lot of money for repair. Yeah. You're fighting a loser battle. If you were a defeatist, come on, tell me how it works. You're there. absolutely right. And sometimes it's, it's just overwhelming. And I just think, what am I doing here? Um, and, but it, it does, um, funny enough, John used to describe Kiligar as being a kind of a mistress that uh, he had this um, enticing mistress that he couldn't ever quite get away from. And he would travel the world and do all sorts of things, but he always came back to Kiligar. And it does have a sort of grip. I think it has a hold on you now. You're not, you're not a lineage of this, of this house, but it has a hold on you, hasn't it? Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. I can't imagine ever living anywhere else. Okay, you're holding on to it now and you're doing your best. Um, and it's going to go, do you hope it's going to go on or, or what do you hope for it? Because as it goes on, it's going to be harder to keep. Unfortunately, that's right, and also it deteriorates more and more. Um, we've been very fortunate, Leitrim County Council have actually been very good to us, and the Heritage Council, and we have already got some grants in the pipeline to do some work, basically just fundamental roof repairs and gutter repairs, um, which is terrific. I mean, it's a tiny bit of money compared to what does need doing, but we're very grateful for anything like that that we can get. And we kind of, I kind of go around with blinkers on a lot of the time and I just have to concentrate on I'll just do this room or I'll just do this little bit mm -hmm. and try not to look at the overall. Do you ever, ever just wake up some morning in the freezing night maybe and just say, <laughs> oh hell, I'm getting out of here, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, I want it does, to it does cross my mind uh, from time to time and I do get frustrated. But then the flip side is that, you know, we had glorious weather there at the end of May and in June. And uh, every day I made myself actually just down to us in the house, go down to the lake, sit by the house lake, which is the most beautiful, beautiful tra tra the tranquil lake, area. And that's a bit like being able to get away and be on holiday and just sort of play hooky from school, if you like, and just enjoy the grounds. 
It's very difficult for me to relax here because there's always something to do. Every time I walk into a room, I see something else that needs doing. And then I walk outside in the grounds and I see the, you know, the forestry needs to be thinned or there's a tree across the avenue that needs to be collected or you know, somebody's very kindly cut up timber and needs to be brought in. Or there's you know, some other bit that needs repairing or the, the wisteria is going crazy across the bedroom window. I need to get up on a ladder and cut it down or I need to I get some... I think are getting all over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to move forward. Yeah, we'll I'm get you some working gloves before you go home today. <laughs> yeah, it's hard work. You can see the hard work just driving up the drive. Uh, yeah. You are also an avid an avid animal lover, yes. an activist indeed, indeed you've been in the news lately and unfortunately it's right on our own doorstep now. That's right. And Unfo- farming. That's right. Unfortunately Cavan is um, one of Ireland's leading puppy farm places and I... That's amazing, you know, that, to think of that, like, I can't believe that. Well, Actually, it's I saw it done by BBC uh, Panorama Group. That's right, it was exposed by the Panorama Group. We knew that the puppy farms were there, but it took the BBC interview, um, not interview, sorry, the BBC documentary to expose it. And um, as soon as that happened and it was on the doorstep, I mean, it's Cavan, it's the doorstep here. And my goodness, nobody like you who got together, got the people meeting you, you got the people in the town square of Cavan Town, you got the animals lovers out. But more than that, than just doing a basic demonstration, uh, you got you made the people aware of, of, of every part of every aspect of it, of like what animal farming means, how cool it is, how bad psychologically it is to animals, how bad it is to buy animals from these farms. That's right. Yeah, it's very strange. What now? Please answer me honestly. Right. Since the pressure you've put on huge, you to your 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 um, your Facebook page have put huge pressure on, made it very aware. Has anything happened? Has anything changed? I think things will be changing. Um, there has been a puppy farmer, uh, James Kavanagh in Carlo, who has recently been charged with animal cruelty. And uh, obviously that's an ongoing case, so we can't really make any comment on that. But I would like to see that all puppy farmers, particularly in County Cavan, because as I say, that's on my doorstep, um, that they would be looked into, investigated, and to see whether or not they are uh, breeding their puppies and dogs in the way that they are claiming they, they are and that they should be. Uh, my fundamental problem with it is that dogs are companion animals and they, they shouldn't be battery farm bred like battery hens. I mean, I have a problem with that too, but definitely uh, dogs are not... They will not purport be. he's not cruel to them. They're just have been fed, watered, they're just having puppies. That's normal for dogs. They're being kept in boxes. They're never seeing the light of yeah. day. Um, for instance, in yeah. Kavanaugh's, uh, some of Kavanaugh's puppies had their feet, their paws were burnt off because they were left standing in their own urine and feces. Oh, okay. Um, so they Curity. had to be destroyed, yeah, yeah, a lot of them. And I'm not saying that that's the case with the Cavan puppy farmers because I don't know. But uh, what I would like is for Cavan County Council to be investigating it properly. I know the ISPCA are. Andrew Kelly's been very active, um, and I, I think he's been very thorough in what he's doing. He's, he's doing a very difficult job. But also the legislation needs to be changed. Yeah, I would just say you, yeah. you, you've, you've put pressure on here to make sure locally that they are abiding by the rules, which maybe or maybe not people have been let do their own thing. We don't know. We can't make any comment on that. But you need to start a change with the legislation, which will take time. That's right. I've been in touch with the legislators because basically if you appeal to the minister, by the time he's got new, um, new policy, it's too late. So I've been in touch with the bureaucrats who actually draw up the new legislation and the amendments, and I will be in touch with them. Um, I'm actually having a meeting with a woman who is a barrister, uh, Liz Walsh, who's uh, going, to, we're going to put our heads together, and another woman called Claire uh, Turner, who, who does the Facebook page, Pups Not Profit. Uh, we're all very committed to making a change. This will be a threefold thing. People need to be educated. Don't buy a puppy from a breeder. Go to a good rescue and adopt a dog from there. Even buying or getting a puppy, not buying one, but getting one from a pound, is a bit um, difficult because you, you, the dog hasn't been temperament assessed. If you go to a rescue, it will have been. So we have to get that message across to people. Mm. It's education on the ground. We need to, we'd like to really make it fashionable for people to have rescue dogs instead of thinking that there's something great about spending 800 quid on a puppy and isn't mm. it great? And then the poor thing dies, you know, three months later because it hasn't been, mm. it hasn't been bred properly, basically. I have no doubt that you will put the pressure on and that you will see, you, you will see it through. Absolutely. So to get back to you, uh, I'm interested to know um, uh, what your interests and your hobbies are, um, where you like to go on holidays, what, what you like to do here, and you do live in a, in, a, in a different world, in another world, which is, well, 
a long way away from big towns and things like that. What do you like to do of an evening? Well, uh, probably um, reading is always good. Um, uh, sometimes uh, playing a game of sequence. Uh, my partner Joe and I are quite addicted to this uh, this game. It's it's a board game, and uh, we have a lot of fun playing that. Um, um, also, really, just chilling out. I mean, come six o'clock, that's it, down tools. And when you mention holidays, um, anywhere hot. <laughs> The thought of paying money to go somewhere cold is a complete anathema to me. So um, if ever we go away, we, we go to Spain or... or Do you, are you involved somewhere? in anything in the local community? We're on the borders here of Calvin and uh, Leitrim. Uh, do you go to bingo? Sorry, do you, do, <laughs> no. you, do you go to the theatre if you get the chance? Do you we go do. to musicals or what, what kind of things do you There's like? There's actually a very good theatre in Carrigallon called the Cornmill Theatre and they put on some fantastic productions and I tend to go to those. Um, I was actually invited also to a gallery opening last Friday um, at to the uh, Town Hall. Oh, no, sorry. it's in Tramila. Um, it's a, gr a group of local artists and they actually come up here once a year and they, they come and they paint here, um, either in the grounds of the weather's, weather's permitting or they, they sit inside here and they, and they paint uh, here, so that's quite fun. Do you get um, invited to places because you're Lady Cabracken or because you're a lady, because um, you're Sue? No, I don't think so necessarily. Um, possibly, no, not, perhaps not as often as I would like. <laughs> Um, but of course the other thing that I do and I spend far too much time on is my Facebook page, Fairy Dog Mothers, which is the page that organises transports for dogs. Have you good coverage here? Good coverage here? Uh, for the internet? Yeah. Yes, occasionally, but sometimes if it rains, it's <laughs> just forget it. You might as well just down to us, it's not going to happen. So that actually keeps me disproportionately busy and quite often if I wake up at three o'clock in the morning... You're passionate about the fairy... The fairy dog fairy mothers, dogs yes, thing. definitely. Well, we moved, we've moved over a thousand dogs probably this year mm. and uh, even this weekend and I know no, it's a terrific help to rescues, uh, it really is. You're passionate, you're so passionate about dogs. And yeah. Tell me the names of your two doggies outside. Oh, I've got uh, Mr. Darcy and Miss Elizabeth Bennett. Obviously. They're so friendly. From Pride and Prejudice, yes they are. Yeah. He's Darcy and she's Bessie, yes they're lovely, they're, they're border collies. Would you have grown up with horses and things like that in Australia, no. on a ranch kind of thing? No, not at all, no. I grew up in, um, my father was in the Air Force, so I grew up on the outskirts of an Air Force base. Um, dead flat and hardly any trees around. The only trees were in our garden because my father was a very keen gardener. So again, coming here to Ireland was totally was different. It was a challenge, yeah, totally oh, different. Oh, it was totally different. Okay. Um, apart from anything else too, then when I grew up and worked, I worked in Melbourne. And Melbourne is quite a sophisticated city. And to come uh, from there, I, I did a European tour, uh, the typical Australian, you know, took three months off and went to see, you know, like Florence today and Rome tomorrow, that sort of thing and then uh, wound up coming here, fell in love with Ireland, but the dramatic change was incredible because, uh, you know, in Melbourne at that time we had all kinds of cuisine, we had all kinds of food, amazing produce. And here, locally, you could get, you know, um, potatoes, carrots, cauliflower... And more potatoes. Cabbage, yeah, and sprouts <laughs> at Christmas. And two kinds of cheese, red cheese and white cheese. Who's ever seen red cheese before? I mean, it's the same cheese, it's just died. Um, okay, so that so, was a huge culture yeah. shock. Yeah, and uh, also as well in Ireland, um, uh, do you have, are you here, you, you don't have any family, I know your son goes forward and back to England, but are you here? No, he's not, uh, he, uh, actually he's in uh, Canada. Canada? He was in are England. You, are you the only person in your family here? Yes, that's right. And that is again, it's a very isolating uh, factor and it is also again uh, contributes to being in a very sort of isolated place here as well. Uh, because I don't have any uh, family, my you know immediate family at all 10,000 miles away. And that's tough. Um, my son has gone to Canada and he's extremely happy there. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's got a fantastic job and everything's going well for him. But what changes is if you marry and have children in a place and then you set down roots because the children go to school, mm. that sort of thing. And the children grow up, they don't see their grandparents, they don't see their aunties and uncles or their cousins. It's, it's a very different life. Um, Do you see your life purpose now? To, to bring a bit, to, to not let Kiligar House die? Yes, I think I can't stop myself. Um, I've, I've thought of all sorts of different events and things to do here. We've had music festivals, we've had open air theatres, we even had a mushroom festival. So if anybody listening out there sees this, yes, this, this is where you can bring your, if you want an unusual venue, Absolutely. a venue with a difference. 
and it helps. We, yeah. we even had a music video uh, filmed here last year too, which was great. The I guys can see who came, why, yeah. Yeah, the guys who came absolutely loved it. So any ideas you have like that? This, this you want to, to bring life and use the uniqueness of Killing yeah, Our House. Absolutely. Okay, it's all it's it's well, it's old and it's hard to heat, but it's certainly different. It is, um, but unfortunately, people come. I, I belong to um, a, it's a website called Trusted House Sitters, where because if we want to get away, we have to have somebody come in and look after the dogs. We were really lucky in March. We had a fantastic couple who came from the Isle of Wight. He uh, was a retired vet, and uh, and his wife is retired nanny, and they were just gorgeous. And they stayed here, and they I think struggled with the cold, even though I told them it was going to be cold. And unfortunately, I get people from California and all over the world saying, yes, yes, we'd love to come and stay in your house, but they don't realise the reality of it. Um, I mean, one year, when we had, we had two very bad winters on the trot, and the second year I thought, well, I won't get caught without water this year. I'll fill one of the baths with water, so at least we can bucket water in and flush the loose. And the water in the bath froze, so that's how cold it gives. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. It was something like minus fourteen inside. Yeah. So you sort of get dressed up like an onion and <laughs> sit up by the fire. Yeah. Well, that is, as I say, uh, the house consumes you. But, Lady Sue, I'd like to thank you for speaking us to, to, for speaking to us on our program today, for letting us into your house, and uh, for telling what it is, what it's like to live in a house like this, for giving us an idea for giving us an idea of your passion, your passion for the house, your passion for the area and your passion for animals and indeed your passion for living in Ireland because you are living here on your own, you're only a member absolutely. of your family here and I think that's that's very positive and I think mm. that's absolutely wonderful and it's great. Uh, I found it really interesting talking thank to you, you and I'd like to thank you very much and uh, we wish you the best thank with you. Gillian Everhouse and thank you. Thanks so much.